it's really nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and um, I'm really just. Oh, what am I meant? There we go. And I'm really just um, testing out um, my idea for this larger project and presenting some uh, fairly still preliminary findings. So. Um, I'll be really interested in the feedback and there'll be some bits where I haven't joined up all the dots yet. Um, so I'll, in a way I'll be talking through my project idea and my um, methodology for a larger project using free range eggs as my example. So the basic idea of the project is that um, consumers, growers and governments are becoming increasingly concerned that the dominant industrial agri-food system delivers cheap, plentiful, reliable food to Western consumers at too high a price in terms of social, ecological and health impacts. Um, and so there's been a number of ways in which they try to point out these impacts of the way we've organised our um, food chains to, pr to produce, process, store, transport and retail food. And various social movements or alternative food politics are trying to change the values and power structures and um, technologies that are embedded or conventionalised in um, these long food chains uh, that we have. And the idea of the project is that in these um, food wars, as one set of authors have called them, uh, regulation and governance at both the global and the domestic level have inevitably become a huge issue of contention. So alternative food movements are arguing for stronger government and intergovernmental regulation of the practices of industrial agri-food all along the food chain, so from things like banning battery cages um, to advertising junk food to children. They've also created new civil society regulation to support new niche markets for alternative food production, so organic, free range and so on. Um, and then powerful players in the conventional agri-food system have also responded um, by creating their own industry self-regulatory accreditation and labelling um, schemes and by strategically contesting attempts um, to better regulate hot issues like genetic modification, pesticide use, food safety, wastage and so on. Okay, so that's the big picture of the sort of phenomenon that I'm interested in. Um, and there's a tendency towards seeing consumer choice at the domestic level and perhaps free trade at the international levels as um, important ways to change this whole system. Um, and it's often put in terms of shortening the distance between the consumer and the producer um, in terms of the number of links in the food chain, so bringing me closer to the hen. Um, or giving me as the consumer more knowledge about what goes on um, and sense of connection. So what, um, so, and regulation, um, trying to change this system is a big part of it. So what I'm trying to do um, with my project is a series of um, what I call radically inductive case studies of particular foods, um, primary products that raise issues of contention within the industrial agri-food system. And with each one of them, I'm going to start with the consumer eyes view of that food and then trace back through the food chain how the regulatory pathways taken and not taken helped create the consumer choices that we see before us. Um, and how and what choices have been constructed for us to give us the chance to put these alternative values back into the food chain and change it. So how have the social movement politics of alternative food used regulation to try and construct um, new choices for us and new pathways back through the food chain? And how have powerful industrial agri-food players resisted or co-opted or adapted to those attempts to change their values? Um, and specifically how have they used regulation to do so. Um, or to put it more abstractly, how has regulation um, helped to shape and transform capitalism in response to social movement politics? Um, so how is consumer choice in the market constructed by regulation? What other regulatory responses and pathways are being created or could have been or still are possible and what difference does it make to values, interests and power structures? 
Okay, so that's the um, sort of theoretical question that I'm coming at. And what I'm interested in to start with is my first case study is eggs and free-range eggs. Um, and the issue that's had most airplay in the national media with free-range eggs um, is how many hens per hectare should be allowed to count as free-range. Um, I'll just say it's slightly different here in Canberra because there is, has been a stronger social movement here to ban cage eggs, and I'll come back to that um, at the end because Canberra has therefore used a regulatory pathway that's a bit different to the rest of Australia. Okay, but the contest at the moment is mainly a contest <laughs> over one provision in the um, industry association's voluntary quality assurance system. So the Egg Corporation is the industry association. They have a quality assurance system that does all sorts of things, and what, but one part of it is that it says that if um, you can use a free-range system, and a free-range system um, is one um, that meets X definition. Um, their anim the animal welfare part of the Egg Corporation's um, accreditation system is based on the government's model code of practice, which is not mandated, it, but it's there um, as a standard. And it currently says that 1,500 hens per hectare on an outdoor range um, constitutes free range, um, although the Egg Corp um, contests this and says that it's it, what it means is 1,500 hens per hectare if they don't move around and it can there's no limit if they do move around to other paddocks. Um, and they're arguing that there should be an absolute maximum of 20,000 per hectare. Um, and I've given you on... Oh, no, I haven't because it didn't work. Sorry, I thought I'd moved on. I think I did it on there. <laughs> Um, so they say um, that um, it needs to be 20,000 because the market share for free-range eggs has um, moved from 8% to 25% since the 1500 was set. So that's their first argument. And their second argument is that, in fact, at the moment, 29% of free-range egg production in Australia is stocked at densities higher than 20,000 per hectare. Um, and so they say that if they make it 20,000, then it will actually improve um, what's going on at the moment. Um, so what you can see there by their arguments is that what they're trying to do is to frame um, hen welfare in terms purely of the number of hens per hectare. That's their biggest worry. Um, and as, as a matter of individual consumer choice, for those who want to be able to pay a little more but not too much more um, for the luxury of happy hens in their supermarket. Um, so this is my argument about what's going on there. Um, so basically they're saying, well, we have to make the accreditation system match um, the market and the ability for the supermarkets to sell um, these eggs. But this is just <coughs> one small issue raised by... Consumer choice. Raised by um, animal welfare activists about hen welfare and free-range eggs. So I've actually got a handout here that summarises this in more detail. I'm sure I don't have enough, but um, you can have a look. And I've done this so that if people are interested in a personal basis on knowing what they're buying, they, there's also some information there that will help you. Um, so if we look more broadly, at the moment the issue is about how many hens per hectare outside, but actually um, if you look at what the free range farmers movement is worried about or um, animal welfare activists, um, there's of course also the issue of how many hens inside, um, not just outside. Um, there's the issue of beak trimming, which is that they chop the tip of their beaks or more off very early so that they won't um, peck each other. Um, and if you've got a lot crowded in, then that's a big problem. But 
free range, um, smaller scale free range farmers say that if they're outside and happy, they won't be pecking each other either. There's environmental issues about um, the ground that they're actually um, ranging over and whether it is actually able to support vegetation um, and whether or not. So in the sort of, um, in the large scale egg production, you end up with hens on basically um, dirt and they're eating um, grain feed and it's not what you imagine it to be basically whereas the small scale ones then rotate them through paddocks or maybe they have a mixed farm where they go in after the cows or um, whatever so they have an ecological system okay so there's a range of bigger issues um, with um, animal welfare and what free range means and for the purposes um, of um, my, this is, sorry, this is a picture of a um, cage system. It's a very nice picture. Um, <laughs> uh, for the purposes of my uh, project, I'm arguing that there's really three kinds of bigger issues that uh, the social movement of alternative food is raising with industrial agri-food um, system. And I think these are all raised by the um, issue of cage hens and free-range hens. Um, so this is a picture of the traditional sort of cage. This is by one of the manufacturers of the barn system. So this is what they want you to believe. Um, and with the ones that have like 20,000 hens per hectare and call them free range, what they do is they basically take out the cage part of that and they have ramps and things and then they have some pop holes down the bottom so that notionally the chickens can get outside to the range. Um, but in fact, um, most of them won't go outside because they can't find their way or they're too scared to go past the other hens um, or it's not attractive enough out on the range anyway because it's all been um, eaten out. Um, this is a picture, I don't know if you can see from Animals Australia, that's what one of those things actually looks like once um, 10,000 chickens have been pooing all over it for a couple of years. Um, and that's meant to tell us that, um, so one of the issues is agroecological. So if you think about layer um, intense factory farming of eggs, um, then it's not just about whether the hen has enough room to move, that's an important issue, but it's also about the ecological burden of industrial agri-food and things like what do you do with all these um, faeces from the chickens is a huge issue. Um, and uh, part of the idea of free range is that you might come up with a more holistic agroecological system. Another issue um, with um, the industrial agri-food system is um, public health issues. Um, so a lot of the contest over the industrial agri-food system is about um, as you probably know, the overproduction of overprocessed, energy dense but nutritionally poor food at, at cheap prices, um, as opposed to kind of real food eaten in a physically healthy and socially, culturally, and relationally meaningful way. So, what we get, um, you can see that illustrated here with chickens as well, we get um, eggs that are wider than wide have come from hens that may have been fed antibiotics and so on that are basically unhealthy um, and we're eating the egg that comes out. The end of that, um, there's things like we're running the risk of, at a public health level of um, creating new viruses and so on like avian flu um, and perhaps we're also producing um, eggs um, that include, uh, that aren't as nutritionally healthy as, as they might be. Um, and my third <coughs> issue um, is 
uh, the justice issue. So at a general level with industrial agri-food, the issue then is that the industrial agri-food system, um, the alternative food politics people say, is systemically unjust in the way it shares out the benefits of, and risks of where, what and how food is grown, produced, transported, distributed, accessed and <coughs> eaten. So the burdens of the ecological degradation and um, the benefits of access to healthy, meaningful, affordable food aren't, aren't shared out evenly. Um, so, you know, we create the billion hungry and the billion obese, the land grabbers and the smallholders, um, those who live near the farms at the edge of cities who suffer pesticide drift and smells and whatever, and those of us who live in the inner city and go to the Queen Victoria markets or what every day. Um, in the egg situation, um, so these are some hens that I visited that are very happy. They're getting a lot of justice and that's a pile of several thousand day old male chicks who are going to get um, minced up and used as pet food or stock or something. So that's one of the little injustices um, in the system. We might also um, think about the way um, one of the big issues at the moment um, for us in Australia is the supermarket duopoly and the way that that's created a system where we have large scale producers um, who have access to the national market um, and small scale farmers who have to, well, who may, who don't have access to that market and who argue that they're suffering um, injustice, that they don't have easy access to a retail market. Um, and again, free range farming is one way to try and create an alternate um, way of for a small scale producer to get to a consumer. Um, so I've just put that there because it says it's at one of the supermarkets in Canberra and it says our fresh eggs come straight from a farm. So as you can see what they're trying to do is they're trying to tell you that you're very connected to the source of your food as a consumer despite the fact that there's actually quite a few links in the chain between buying a carton of eggs at a supermarket and the hen and the that produce the egg and whatever, however they're the sun and the earth that produce their feed, there's probably even a few steps between those, the hen and the, the actual environment. Um, so alternative um, social movements around food use these agroecological public health and justice um, values as a basis for trying to contest, unsettle and then reconnect the, the chain in industrial agri-food. Um, using different values and privileging different players. So my research project sees the debate about the Egg Corporation standard um, and the various competing voluntary accreditation systems, which um, you saw briefly on that PowerPoint slide, um, as an indication of a bigger um, contest over the whole approach to creating the food chain between the hen and the consumer. Um, and it assumes that in order to have a food chain in the first place or to create a new one, you need to use some kind of regulation, formal or informal, such as voluntary accreditation systems. Um, and I'm going, I won't talk much about theory, but when, as I write it up, I'll be able to draw on different theoretical literatures to talk about that. So we might put it in terms of rationalities of governance or orders of worth. Um, or um, actor network theory. Um, so I'll just mention that for the moment. But the kind of um, questions that we might ask then is we might look at, well, how are they using um, regulation to create a new food chain or to unsettle the existing one? Um, and how do they construct what value it is um, how, that they're trying to achieve? Do they see it as a public good, like the alternative um, food politics see it, um, those public goods? Or do they see it as an individual good, consumer choice to have the luxury of being ethical? Who decides what the standards are? Um, where in the chain does the regulation kick in? 
who bears the burdens and benefits and does the regulatory form open up or, or close down the possibility for further expansion of the kind of, ish, of, the kind of values um, that are coming into the food chain. Um, Okay, so what um, we did with our research um, is try to uncover the chain between the consumer and producer. So um, we looked at the retail, um, how eggs are retailed, and then tried to trace back from that. We looked for, you know, whether they had claims about being free range or whatever, and then try to trace back from that what regulation has helped to support those claims. Um, and then we went and... So I've just, and then we went and actually talked to some of the farmers and some of the accreditation agencies and so on to understand how they actually worked. So I'm going to give you a quick run through of what we've been finding by looking at what's actually available and how that relates to the food chain and how regulation supports that. I don't actually know how long I'm meant to be talking for, by the way. Uh, another 20 minutes. Okay, that's good, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so what we've found is a few different categories. So what we did is we went and looked for and bought all the different kinds of free-range eggs that we could in different retail spaces in um, Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne. We did it in Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne because there's kind of different regulatory debates and pathways in those areas so, and also different other conditions. So we wanted to see whether there was anything different. Um, and we found a few different um, categories of um, free range egg. And what we're looking at is uh, where they're sold, how they're displayed and um, what that's telling you about the story that they're trying to sell, also what's on their label and what that's trying to tell you about, um, about these eggs and the connection between the consumer and, and the hen. So the main category and the one I'll talk mainly about is what I'm calling industrial or supermarket free range. Um, and this is available in... Um, Coles and Woolies and also IGA in every jurisdiction that we looked at and pretty much the same brands are available everywhere um, and they're aimed at the supermarket sale of this industrial egg so they basically maintain um, the, the dominant system um, factory, intense <coughs> factory farming um, but they seek to um, create the idea of the choice to buy an ethical egg from a happy hen um, by telling us that it's free range, um, that it's being sold by a nice, clean, trustworthy supermarket. Um, sometimes there's information on the packs um, and then about the system and there's a lot of branding, you know, pictures of hens and grass or um, beautiful eggs or sunshine um, or just lots of yellow or lots of green um, that tell us that, try to get us to have the feeling that the hen has been very much in connection with um, the sun and, and the grass. Um, most of these one, uh, uh, so yeah, so that these are the ones that are basically, in order to ensure this consistent supply to all these supermarkets, these are um, ones that are produced in huge barns with maybe 8,000 hens or something. Um, okay, so what's happening is that we see that the, they're, uh, they're trying to give us a different choice um, or make us feel like we've got a different choice and certainly the number of people who are buying these free-range eggs is increasing. So as you see, it's increased from 14.5% um, to 28% between 2005 and 2011. Um, and interestingly, 
the shelf space um, is even larger. So we have 28% of eggs that are sold are free range, but 50% of the shelf space um, is free range. Uh, we did look at Canberra. Uh, oh, unfortunately, I can't get state by state breakdowns of what proportion of free range versus cage is um, sold in the different states because it would be really fascinating to know that whether it's different here in Canberra where you have the big labels um, on the shelves. But it is, I thought that maybe that would mean there'd be more free range and less cage as a proportion on the Canberra shelves, but there wasn't. It's still the same, 50%. Um, free range on the carton and in the branding also means, of course, a price premium at the supermarket for the producer and the retailer. Um, so people are eating more eggs lately, the last 10 years or so, and they have been quite profitable in general, um, but there's been quite large costs in the last five or six years as well because um, the cost of feed went up, presumably because of the drought. Um, supermarkets, as you know, are trying to keep prices very low. Um, and there were also new cage requirements introduced a few years ago. So the cages have to be bigger, which means that producers had to in, um, invest in new um, barn systems. So you can see that the option of putting in place a barn system that they can call free range and get a, limited, a price premium, but a limited price premium through the supermarket would be very attractive in that context. Um, and so you can see there um, what the price premium um, is. Um, so the average price per dozen for any eggs is $4.43, but you can um, generally charge um, at least $5.50 in a supermarket and um, up to $10 or $11 for organic free range eggs in um, specialty shops. Um, free range also means that cage eggs aren't, brand, aren't banned though, of course. The need to brand something as free range means that the alternative, the um, movement to completely ban cage eggs um, hasn't yet succeeded. So. Um, that's, uh, that's uh, part of the system that you have a choice. Um, it's not that we've decided to regulate back on the farm. We're giving the consumer the ability to regulate right at the other end of the chain. Okay, and then most of these supermarket free range eggs are Egg Corp accredited. So. And it's interesting that if you look on them, you won't actually necessarily even see a little logo saying they're Egg Corp accredited because what is happening is the supermarket is saying they could should be Egg Corp accredited um, and not they're saying to the consumer, trust us that these are free range if we're selling them as free range. But this whole debate about stocking densities is because uh, partly because the supermarkets have then said, okay, um, we need to be able to sell more eggs, more free range eggs at a cheap price. Uh, so the Egg Corp is responding to that. Um, and the Egg Corp is also beginning to realise that consumers themselves are worrying about it. So they want to be able to put something on the cartons and explain it um, to consumers. And so they're starting to look at having a marketing strategy that isn't just aimed at the supermarket as the regulator, but at the consumer as the regulator. So that's the industrial free range. And then we also found some other options um, not available in the supermarkets. So there's what I'm calling true in inverted commas free range or accredited free range. And this is basically <coughs> only available in Melbourne at farmers markets and boutique stores. These are brands um, that rely very heavily on plain packaging, perhaps with accurate looking photos rather than sort of professionally produced photos of happy hens. 
um, or hand-drawn storybook type images. They don't look too professional. Our interviews with farmers said often they purposely don't look professional, so they might actually encourage themselves to put the labels on skew if or something. <laughs> Um, and these are accredited by the Free Range Farmers Association or Humane Choice, um, which have quite much stricter standards, as you can see by the handout. Um, they're sold a lot at farmers markets and other specialty stores. Often, especially at the farmers markets, um, they will have like a poster board out the front of the stall that gives a lot of information about the system and might also include activism against cage eggs or supermarket free range or other um, people who are selling free range eggs. Um, and so they use that to explain their trustworthiness to customers and to justify the price premium. Um, but you also wonder whether this accreditation is really necessary because if they're being sold at farmers markets and so on, then it's the producer there that the consumer can ask anyway. So why do they need an accreditation system? And in fact, that's why it's been interesting um, to do the research in Sydney and Canberra because in Sydney and Canberra, nobody's accredited with these Free Range Farmers Association and, or Humane Choice. So I'm calling that personal connection free range. So they're pretty much the same sort of systems and labels and so on on their eggs, but you just ask the person at the stall um, or you go to somewhere like Choku by Joe where they tell you that they've got it from a particular farm down the road. But what's interesting is in Sydney and Canberra, the emphasis seems to be on whether it's local and how it tastes and how fresh it is, whereas in Melbourne, the emphasis seems to be on how ethical it is and whether it's accredited. So take away from that what you want. Um, but of course, the problem is that where there isn't any accreditation, um, then you do have to actually have the conversation. And if you go somewhere... Um, well, let's that, that's, uh, I should have also said organic seems way more important in Sydney and Canberra compared with Melbourne, um, which seems to go with the taste thing. Um, so that's a very popular brand in Sydney and maybe Canberra. Um, but, so, but once you go to some of these markets, especially in Sydney and Canberra, where they don't have any accreditation, and once you start asking questions, you actually do start to find that some of them are not the really small-scale ones. They are bigger ones, and if you start knowing the right questions to ask, you start finding out some things that um, might make you question it, like, for example, um, hens being locked up until midday because they need to lay and um, the farmer doesn't want them to lay outside because of all the shit lying around, which makes you wonder whether that's really the idea of free range that you thought. Okay. Um, Um, there's also other dodgy, what I call dodgy free range um, around. Um, so you've probably heard about cases where in order to get the supply for the supermarkets or whatever, um, people have substituted cage eggs for free range. Um, we've also found some um, labels where they have little things that look like accreditation logos that aren't really ones. We also found one where they seem to have actually abused one of the real ones. Um, and then we could also talk about um, can't be bothered checking free range, which I guess is what I, I was just mentioning. So non-accredited free range that may not meet any particular definition of free range. Um, and um, so retailers who can't be bothered checking can sell that. And as far as I can work out, or perhaps don't want to be bothered, um, as, as far as I can work out, IGA and Aldi fit into that category. So Coles and Woolies have standards. They're very low standards in terms of what free range means, but it is a set of standards, the Egg Corp standards 
whereas IGA and Aldi don't have anything. They may the production system may actually fall somewhere in between huge scale industrial free range and what we might think of as true small scale free range. So they may be better than Coles and Woolies eggs, but we can't be sure. All right, conclusions then. The conclusions are a bit long though. Um, so first set of conclusions. So what I'm interested in is that capitalism, markets are constantly evolving and changing in response to social movements, politics, new expressions of values, new technologies, new efficiencies, and regulation, deregulation, re-regulation are helping um, to capitalism to adapt and change. It's regulation helps create new markets, constrain and change existing markets, perhaps shut down markets. Um, and so the interesting thing we want to know then is how it's changing and what, what the regulation is doing um, to help that change be um, go in one direction or another, be more substantive or symbolic. Is it co-opting and conventionalising social movement values in a way that sucks the life out of them or is it um, doing something else? So um, my preliminary conclusions, um, looking at the supermarkets then, what we see is a lot of industrialisation and conventionalisation of alternative free range values. So we see um, the selling of basically traditional industrial eggs, but with some improvements. Uh, so it's a modification to the existing food chain and the existing product rather than something that's a big substantive um, difference. There is, however, one free range farmers association accredited alternative brand available in uh, Melbourne Coles's. So there is one brand which is a substantially different product rather than just a minorly different product. Um, and um, in line with what I said before, in um, Sydney and Canberra, there are some organic brands that seem to be, may be substantially different, although um, they're Sunny Queen and Pace, which are two of the big producers. I forgot to tell you that um, egg production is dominated by three big producers in Australia who have about half the market. Um, there is one premium organic brand which we found in Woolworths in Neutral Bay. So again, them, uh, which is um, certainly a substantially different product. So on the whole, we don't see new product categories in the supermarket, or rather we see a sort of differentiated product available in the supermarket that's called free range, but we don't see a substantially new product in the supermarket as a response to free range. Um, however, we do see niche retailers, farmers markets, organic food stores and so on that seem to have a growing place in the market. And as far as um, the standard figures are that the supermarkets have about 50% of the market for fresh food sales and um, farmers markets and uh, organic food stores and so on have about 7% and appear to be growing. Um, but they appear to be largely a separate alternative, you know, sort of hippie market rather than necessarily a huge um, challenge to the supermarkets. But I guess that's the question. Um, we've also seen a number of misleading and deceptive labelling cases which might appear to give consumers confidence they can buy true free range wherever they look. But because we don't actually have any um, agreement about the meaning of free range, that's actually essentially meaningless. In other words, you can't police free riding if the issue is the social construction of the meaning of the thing that they would be free riding off. So if you don't know what free range is, you, can't, uh, you can only effectively police against the really, really egregious cases. Um, second lot of... So that was conclusions about what's changing in the market and then, of course, the interesting question for us 
um, what regulatory, so I've given you a bit of a flavour of some of the regulatory paths that have um, supported those things that have changed. And then the interesting thing is what regulatory paths have not yet been taken but may have been possible or may still be possible. Um, how might we, how might there be regulatory pathways that might see free range as more of a collective good rather than as an individual good right at the end of the food chain at the point of consumer choice? Um, at what other stages of the process might regulation of free range have kicked in other than at the point of consumer purchase through voluntary accreditation systems? And some of the things that we might have thought about would be some kind of regulation or incentivisation of environmental sustainability or health of the farms um, that might um, force producers out of intensive factory farming altogether. But of course there's also the alternative that they'll just come up with more technological solutions to deal with things like disposing of all the um, faecal matter and so on. Um, the regulation of on-farm welfare practices. So far in Australia we've only got a, this model code of practice, it's not mandatory. Um, we've got very minimal regulation of cages. Um, but egg producers are well aware that there's a ban on battery cages in the EU and increasingly in the US and that that may well come here. Um, and a lot of this debate about free range and voluntary accreditation systems is to s take attention away, f I think, from the possibility that we might regulate on-farm welfare practices better. Another issue is competition policy and supermarkets, um, which might, if we, if we took a different pathway that had prevented Coles and Woolies becoming the BMOF duopoly, making their choice being the ones essentially regulating what free range really means for most people, um, then we might have opened up retail pathways that gave consumers different choices and also gave smaller farmers um, more choices. Um, here in Canberra you've got ma a mandatory definition and labelling of free range and cage eggs and at least that sort of moves the issue makes the definition a bit clearer and moves the issue back in the chain a little bit more because it makes the retailer responsible rather than the consumer having to figure it all out. But of course, if the definition you choose is the absolute lowest common denominator and the one that the supermarkets already kind of use, then it doesn't actually make much difference as I think our data shows. Um, and then, the finally, the last two is um, sometimes um, what a social movement might want is actually decommodification, so taking something out of the market altogether. And of course we've had a big backyard chook movement these days. Um, and the even more decommodified option, as um, one of the Green Senator in New South Wales said when I went to the forum on free range, he said, well, of course, we could all become vegan and then handed out the vegan cupcakes. So his um, point of view was clear. Um, so now, well, that's some nice backyard chooks I saw in Canberra once. Um, so some of you might have read Julie Guthman's book, Agrarian Dreams, about how the organic movement in California was co-opted and conventionalised be by becoming an industry and seeking accreditation standards and um, regulation. And she argued that this actually de-radicalised the hippie organic movement and set back agroecological values in farming in California by breaking down the social movement that could have kept on providing a continued critique of the dominant system. So I guess the questions that this leaves for me with free range eggs is whether these alternative markets that we've got, these free range, uh, these farmers markets that give the small scale farmers um, a pathway to the consumer whether these are strong enough to provide a continued critique of supermarket free range so that there might be continued um, incremental improvement or whether the supermarket duopoly is so powerful that they'll fail eventually um, and with what other regulation at what other points along the food chain might, um, might also help support um, further change. Um, and then, of course, the Egg Corporation are very worried about the possibility of imported eggs. Um, and this might be a beat up 
Um, but on on the other hand, um, you can understand with all the panic about um, World Trade Organization rules and so on that there might be a real fear that in the long run um, the restrictions that we have now that don't allow eggs to be imported may be broken down at some point under the pressure of the need for the industrial agri-food system to provide cheap eggs um, and that may come in and um, create a, a different situation. Okay, and I've talked for way too long. Great, but <laughs>
for there to be heaps more small-scale, true, free-range farms than there is at the moment, which suggests that there might also be space for the price to go down if there was more. But that raises the, the issue of context-specific trade-offs. I mean, um, look, for example, in Norway, where uh, I imagine most people are able to afford uh, mm. uh, eggs that are sustainably and more humanely produced. Look, for example, in Hong Kong, where the idea of backyard uh, farming is... is uh, uh, yeah, that's question. true. Yeah, uh, that's true. Horses for courses. Yeah. Next question? Just a, a follow-up on that uh, the issue of the small-scale farming. Uh, are there constraints on regulating the small-scale producer? I don't know. That's one of the things that I want to look at is, um, yeah, so I'm just beginning. So what I want to do is I want to sort of then trace back, well, there could be different pathways. Why is it that we don't have more small-scale retailers um, or more small, small-scale farmers and retail spaces for them? Um, and to what extent is that about the retail spaces or to, why, or to what extent is it about whatever limits there are, including regulatory problems with setting up um, small-scale farms. So I don't know. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. I wondered in terms of regulatory solutions, um, well, as I was listening to you, I thought of uh, the paper by Echolov, uh, the economist who wrote this very famous paper called The Market in Lemons, which is this idea that under conditions of asymmetry where the uh, seller knows much more than the buyer, uh, the seller can basically put stuff onto the market that will ultimately see good products being driven out of the market because consumer confusion sets in and all sorts of other things happen. And one of Akalov's solutions to that problem was the brand, the trademark, truth in labelling. Yeah. But it seems to me that since Akalov wrote that paper, I mean it's an old paper back in the 1960s now, what we actually see happening in the marketplace is this huge pro proliferation around brands. And so the asymmetry, as it were, continues. Yeah. So, and, and this is a sort of problem not just in this area, but you know, right across the board in certification movements now we see that. Um, yeah. So one solution which has been attempted, and I'm not sure whether it's working or not, is this rise of meta-regulation in certification. So ISIL, for example, yeah. is an attempt to, yeah. as it were, set standards for good certification. And that's a sort of way, as it were, of dealing with, yeah. with the re-implementing Akalov's uh, solution. And one can imagine more extreme cases if governments really wanted to introduce truth labelling. I mean, the most obvious example is that you would affect the rights of trademark owners or, or those with ownership rights over labels um, if they were committed to truth in advertising. So you could have a meta-regulator, as it were, mm. setting minimum standards. You could only compete above that standard. You could never go below it. And in extreme cases, as, ha as happened with big tobacco, you lose your trademark rights. And that really then forces um, the, the, the alcohol solution onto the marketplace so that consumers aren't, as it were, hammered anymore by, by asymmetry. Yeah, well, that's a comment, I guess. <laughs> I don't see... Um, it hasn't... I haven't seen it happening, although this, the Humane Choice label, accreditation, that's actually, there's an international society so that seems to be trying to do a bit of that for animal welfare um, labelling. They seem to be trying to get some kind of consistent minimum standard for accreditations. But of course we had the food labelling review in Australia um, a couple of years ago and they basically said values issues are just to be left to voluntary accreditation. There's not, we're not going to set any floor on um, truth in labelling for values issues, only for safety issues. So safety is what 
the dominant industrial agri-food system is worried about and values is what all these alternative food movements are worried about. So they basically said, OK, the regulation's all going to be down at that consume. It's going to be up to the consumer to worry about it. And there's certainly a fair bit of literature on these sort of things pointing out that that puts, uh, overloads the cognitive capacity of, of the consumer. Um, but I would also, I don't know, it probably didn't come through clearly enough, but I guess one of my key arguments is that it's basically giving us the message that this is an individual good that we're buying, that the regulation is creating an individual good that an individual can choose to pay the premium for, whereas some of the other alternatives might have said, oh, this is actually a public good that... Um, implicates bigger value issues um, and so that would suggest different um, regulatory solutions, I think. Yeah. That's a really good point that I, I wanted to bring up that I found really yeah. interesting in your conclusion about the path regulation might be able to take as sort of putting it as a collective action rather than individual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't sort of tell. I mean, yeah. There's a whole story about that. That the free the free range farmers people that I spoke to, they basically put it as they were just they were constructing an alternative market, but they weren't challenging the dominant market. Um, so they were basically saying it's an individual choice, although, as you say, some of them would see it more at, in terms of ecological values, which suggests more of a public good than a purely individual choice to buy hen eggs from happy hens. Um, whereas... Um, the animal activist organisation, so RSPCA um, to some extent, and um, Animals Australia, they've got quite strong campaigns to ban um, cages or at least battery cages, and they see the movement to buy free range as a, a boycott or boycott to support the ban on cage, whereas the Free Range Farmers Association doesn't really see it that way um, and I think it's correct too that the organic associations as Julie Guthman says um, they're not necessarily really arguing strongly for changing the whole system they're also just creating an alternative so yeah it's that's the worry then that they just say okay well we're happy to create this niche market rather than um, look for improvements in the whole system. Well, one more question. Okay. Did you talk to the uh, biological farmers of Australia? Have you I haven't yet. I'm go I've got an appointment with them. I think yeah. it would be good to have a talk to them because they're expanding very fast. Yeah. And, uh, I, I should be clear, we can have a long discussion afterwards. But we're, we, have a, we farm and produce eggs, you know, in a biodynamic organic system, not far from Canberra. Too. Yeah. And we have 12,000 hens and they're out in uh, truly open pastures. <coughs> they go outside all the time. Mm. And they go inside only in the movable sheds. Uh, there's no bottoms in the sheds. Uh, the sheds are moved once or twice a week. So the eggs, the chooks are free to go in and out if they like. They roam over big, big paddocks. They, they might go. 300 metres, 400 yeah. metres away from the sheds. And they go in and inside the sheds, there's only the roosts and the lay, and the lay boxes. All the feed, the yes. even the introduced feed, is outside. Yeah. So it's a true open range system. And we've got biodynamic pastures, so we've got derivative pastures as well. Um, and we can't produce enough eggs 
and they sell up to, I've seen them in Sydney selling for over $15 a dozen and we cannot produce them. Um, the interesting point is that, because I think it's, a, it's really a labour issue, I could talk to you a lot about a <coughs> market issue as well because I've been involved with retail as well. And, but it's, um, um, what we found was that the, in, the information that's on, a, on that has to be the nutrition information on the side of an egg carton is based on the food that goes into the chook. It's not based on, on the egg itself because it's reliable enough because mm -hmm. the only food that the, the chook gets is the prepared, uh, uh, prepared food based on grain. Um, in our case, we don't know what the, what the chicken is eating because they're blaming all day, they're eating bones, and you wouldn't want to be a grasshopper with a chicken back to <laughs> And so, uh, but, so therefore we had the eggs themselves tested. And when we had the eggs tested, we found that the omega-3s in the eggs are over four times what they are in conventional eggs. Oh, that's interesting. And more than double what they are in, organic, in other brands of organic eggs, so-called organic. Um, and so no wonder we can get the high price. But we have to get the high price because it costs more to produce them. And I can't, so going back to the, to the major issue, I can't see how the supermarkets can really ever produce eggs of that sort of quality because you cannot take that much land up in Australia moving chooks around over land. Because in, unless it's done in really big areas, you end up with end up eventually with too much manure on the land. Um, in our case, that doesn't happen. But do you you don't have a system where you have like cow like a mixed do. farm? Yeah, or we have cattle. Put the cattle. Oh, first, okay, so you do do uh, that. And, and that gets the grass down to a certain amount, and then the manure is there for the chooks. Uh, we still can put the cattle through when the chooks are in there. It's not a problem at all. But that um, doesn't. As long as we take off the sheds because they'll rub themselves against the shed. Um, and uh, we're now looking at introducing pigs as well. Uh, pigs first, and then and then then the, then, uh, then the crop, then the chickens, etc. In a rotating system, it can be done. In, mm -hmm. I've seen same Queen in Queensland. I know how they do theirs, and I actually they do it in quite a good way. We have trees in the free range. We do. We don't have enough trees because of the particular country we're on. It just happens to be very open country. So we have to create enough shelf for them. You think trees are important? Very important. So long as they're not trees that they're going to roost in or get under and want to lay eggs under, yeah. it's a bit of a, it's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. But and that, that could be a criticism of that model, that there's not a tree planted in the middle of that, mm -hmm. yeah. that backyard. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they're, you know, they're it's under. It's an important tree, question. But, yeah. and, uh, but I see the, the truth in the labelling as being the key thing. And uh, free range is now, I think, being recognised by the public as being just yeah. We don't use the word free range, we use open range now, and pasture raised, because they're raised on pasture. Because free range, they're now, they're, they're now looking in the, in the free range uh, situ uh, rules to, to, to have them actually go on concrete, because they can keep the concrete clean. Yeah. So um, anyway, it's another discussion I'm happy to talk to you. Great, well, thanks very much for coming. The other thing, seriously, there, there's a very important repo in Sydney called Harris Farm Markets, which you should look at, Harris Farm Markets. Um, and, um, and also, uh, yeah, our exit's all around campus. Yeah. I imagine this discussion will go on <laughs> for a little bit afterwards. But um, I'd just like to say we really hope that you uh, as the project progresses and you move on to your other case studies, you come back and update us on everything. Um, but in the meantime, please join me in thanking you.